Hello, I'm Pasquale Lorino, the conductor of the Racine Symphony Orchestra. I usually stand in front of a group of musicians all together playing and warming up on their instruments before we begin our rehearsals. But today we'll have a chance to hear from each of the individual members of the orchestra and have them tell a little bit about how they got started. This is particularly nice for us in that most of us made the decisions to play our instruments when we were about your age. We have today featured the string section, the woodwind section, the brass section, and the percussion section. We hope you enjoy it. Okay. Well, I'd like to welcome you to a discussion of the instruments of the string section of the orchestra. The string section is the largest section in terms of number of musicians that we have in the orchestra. And it's made up of the violins who are separated into two groups, the viola, and perhaps you can hold up your instrument when I mention your name. And we have the cello, and we have the string bass. And those instruments make up the group of string instruments in the orchestra. We are delighted to be able to welcome the members of the Racine Symphony to demonstrate a little bit their instruments. And I thought perhaps we could start with the very highest instrument in the string section, the violin section. And uh, just ask our violinist, um, what made you want to take the violin? Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Sasha Mandel. I'm the contramaster of the Racing Symphony Orchestra. Nice to see our dear maestro, Pasquale Laurino. Uh, I started the violin when I was four and a half. I had started piano. My mother was a pianist and had started me on piano when I was about three. I used to, you know, just tinker with the keys. And uh, I am from Brazil originally. And when I was four and a half, I had what we call in the conservatory, our little audition, where it was sort of like a mini recital. And I played this little piece on the piano I think was maybe a little something of Bach, very light. And then I sat down and there came this 17 year old girl and she played the violin. And I still remember the piece that she played, which was a Chaconne by Tommaso Vitali, an Italian composer. And my jaw went through the floor. I turned to my mother and said, that's what I want to play. And then Santa Claus brought me a violin for Christmas. It fell <laughs> through the chimney. That's fantastic. And 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 to our violist, uh, what about you, Nick? Why did uh, why why the viola? Well, I chose the viola because one of my friends actually was very interested in the viola, and I wasn't very original. <laughs> okay. <laughs> His reasoning for wanting to play was because it's not too high and it's not too low. And it's it's Goldilocks. It's just right. It's just right, and that's exactly the reason that I that I chose the viola. So I started in went after I was in third grade, and have been enjoying it ever since. That's wonderful. And John, what what what? Why the cello for you? I actually started out on violin. Um, ah. And my parents actually thought that it would be a better fit if I didn't play violin because my brother and sister also played violin. And they switched me to cello and I haven't looked back since. That's, that's great. And, and Kate, why the, why the string bass? Why the double bass? I was in fourth grade. We had the opportunity at school to pick a string instrument and the orchestra teacher demonstrated all the instruments and this is what he did with the bass, if I can show you. And this is why I decided to play the bass. I wanted to play Jaws. <laughs> that was the whole reason. 
<laughs> well, that was the hook and I guess it took. That's great. <laughs> yes. Now, now, as long as you have your base uh, in, your, in your hand, Kate, can you uh, show us how you change pitches on the bass? Sure. You can either do it by changing strings or by pushing a finger down on a string. That's, that's great. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm just curious how that would sound on the cello. John, could you give us an idea of how you change pitches on the cello? Sure. Um, it starts about the same way. You can change strings. Or you can shorten the string by putting a finger down. Or taking them away. That's great. Now, um, I, I noticed that both the double bass and the cello have four strings. Is that also true for the viola? It is true. If you look really closely, you can see that there's four strings. The lowest, the second lowest, the third lowest, and the fourth lowest or the highest, you could say it that way too. Now what you ju just did was a little bit different than what the bass and the cello did. You seem to pluck the strings. Does that have a special name? That's called, that is what's called pizzicato. So oftentimes That's the string players pl just pluck the string. It's Italian for pluck. And you can play this and it creates this nice uh, percussive sound. But we can also use the bow on the viola too. So we can- Could we, we hear that? Like what the cello's like. Yeah, of course. Now, that's terrific. Now, uh, the violin, that looks to be the smallest of the four instruments, still has four strings, um, but can you do the same things that the viola and the cello and the bass did? I can do some of the things that they did. The reason is we share some pitches that seem to be alike. So uh, the pitches that the viola and the cello would have in common with the violin is from the lowest string, which is the G for me, for the D and for the pitch A. Now I have a really thin string called the E that only the double bass has also but backwards that would be her thickest lowest string would be the e. actually as a matter of fact the double bass has the same pitches as the violin but backwards right so, now i'd be curious um could you play your highest string that e and it... go ahead yeah sure sure and then i would like to hear the bass play her e there we go. All right. Can I go first? Yes. Oh, that's so low. I don't, I can't even hear it. Could you do it again, Kate? Good. I think that's beyond the capabilities of, of Zoom that is so, so low. But definitely we imagine that that is going to be quite a bit lower than the violin note that we just heard. Now, getting back to the violin, I noticed with the other players, they use their fingers. Is it possible for, uh, for you to show us what it sounds like if you just slide on the individual strings? Oh yeah, that's fun. That's like gliding. It's like ice skating on the fingerboard. It's really cool. So I can use just one finger and I can go or as a matter of fact, one of the really famous tunes that we all know is all about sliding. Mm. And we know that tune. 
Thank very, you. very good. That's 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 great. I'm wondering now that we've had a chance to hear some of the instruments. Uh, we I, I noticed that you all use, in addition to the violin, the viola, the cello, the bass, you also use something in your right hand that. What, what is that called? That is common in all of your instruments, I think. What is that called? We call it the bow. We call it the bow, indeed. We call it the bow. And there are differences between each of your bows that may be difficult to appreciate, but the most obvious difference is the difference between the violin bow, for instance, and the bass bow. So maybe hold for the camera so that we could see the violin bow and what it looks like. Good. And the viola, let's let's see the viola bow, quite similar to the violin. Yes. And now uh, with the cello bow, if you'll hold that up. Now we can see that that's a little bit bigger all the way around and maybe also a little bit shorter. And now the bass bow, and that looks quite a bit heavier and smaller and i know that the basses has two different types of bows that they use can you tell us a little bit about that kate sure. uh, we have two different styles of bow the german bow is what mine is called and you hold it kind of an underhand hold like this and then there is the french bow which is similar to what the other instruments have that's held overhand like this so you That's can make the same sound with both. It's just a little bit of a different technique. Great, great. Now I'm I'm wondering because it would be great to hear each of you play a, a tune or a song, and you could play whatever you uh, like. It could be Happy Birthday or whatever, uh, just to give us an idea about what it sounds like when your instrument is playing by itself a melody. Okay, could you start? Great. Now, if we asked your bass, how old is your bass? for the second verse of happy birthday. What would your bass say? Well, it doesn't know its exact age, but it is over a hundred years old. Over a hundred years old. Yes. That's fantastic. And what about your bow? My bow is about 20 years old. About 20 years old. That's good. 120 years old altogether. That's fantastic. John, could you play us a tune, maybe something that you like to play? Could be happy birthday or whatever, whatever you'd like. That's beautiful, beautiful sound from the cello. And Nick, uh, could you play us uh, something on your viola? That sounds great, yeah. I'm actually, this is a piece that a couple of my students are playing right now, so I'd be happy to, to share. So maybe you'll have the chance to play something like this. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you very much for sharing the sound of the viola. Now, I, 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 because I asked about the other instruments, Nick, I would like to know a little bit about your, your viola. How old is your viola? So very different than uh, Kate's instrument. My instrument is actually only five years old. It just had its fifth birthday. So I actually had this instrument made for me by a, a maker in Michigan. So, and then my bow, it's kind of unknown. It's got its, it's, it's got a mysterious past that I'm not too, too aware of, unfortunately. Well, I'm so glad that you shared both your bow and your viola with us, as I am glad that we were able to hear from and hear about each of your instruments from the string section of the orchestra. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Welcome everyone. I'm Pasquale Lurino, the conductor of the Racine Symphony Orchestra, and I'm delighted today to welcome the principal players of uh, the woodwind section of the orchestra. We have, let's see, should we go from top to bottom? Maybe the, the highest of the instruments is the flute. Can we hear just a little bit from our flute to give us an idea what it sounds like? That's lovely, the lovely sound of the flutes. And I noticed that the, all of the rest of your instruments, we go, go next to the uh, oboe. Let's hear the oboe sound and compare that with, to what we heard from the flute. That's wonderful. Thank you, Suzanne. I'm, I'm curious, the flute um, has a sound that is different than the oboe. And I notice that the oboe, you are playing into something that is called a reed. Can you tell us a little bit about what the reed does to make the sound in your instrument? Sure. The oboe reed is a double reed. So it is two pieces of wood. It's very small. I'll hold it a little closer. Um, two pieces of wood tied together and the reeds vibrate against each other and that's what makes our sound. So can I make a sound on it? I would like to hear that. So <laughs> that's the sound that goes in the oboe that makes that beautiful music come out. That's amazing. Now, I, I know the, the clarinet also has a reed. Do you have two reeds? Oh, the clarinet actually only has one reed and it goes on the mouthpiece, which is this thing right here, and you blow against the reed and it vibrates against the mouthpiece to make a noise. That's fantastic. So we, can we hear the wonderful noises that you can make on your clarinet? And I was wondering if you could play us what the clarinet sounds like without the, the um, uh, attached to the instrument, like uh, the oboe. Yeah. Um... Well, when you take the clarinet apart like this, it makes a funny little noise. But you go to play and it magically sounds like this.
That's a wonderful sound. It certainly improved when you put the reed into the instrument. Now, I, I the the largest instrument and the lowest instrument of the woodwind section is the bassoon. And uh, we've already given away that the bassoon also uh, plays with the reed. Do you play with one or two reeds? With two reeds. So similar to the oboe, it is a double reed instrument. And uh, could we hear what just the single reed sounds like, if that sounded any different than the oboe double reed? My goodness. And with the instrument. sound of the bassoon. Thank you so much, Christina. I'm, I'm curious why um, uh, you decided to play the bassoon. Was it your first choice? You know, the common thing about, among bassoonists, uh, we don't select the bassoon. The band director selects the bassoon. So, <laughs> I started on the flute, and then one day my band director said, you should try the bassoon. And that was the last day I played the flute and the first day I played the bassoon. That, that's that's fantastic. What about you, Callie? Uh, was a clarinet your first uh, choice of instrument? Actually, um, my first choice was the French horn um, because I was nine years old and I thought French things were cool. And um, then I found out that my mom's best friend played clarinet and she's pretty cool. And I thought she could show me some a few tips along the way. And I. Um, also, my father um, reminded me that my favorite animal in Peter and the Wolf is represented by the clarinet, um, which is the cat. Um, so from that point forward, I was like, well, I have to play the clarinet. Indeed. I, it's, it, it's those reasons that I think all of us uh, started. What about you, Suzanne? Why, why the oval one? Was the oval was your, your first choice or did somebody else decide that for you? No, I decided, but it was not my first choice. I actually started on flute also. I played flute when I was in grade school. And when I hit seventh grade, I got into a band where there were 22 flute players. The band director stood up in front of the group and said, I need some people to change instruments. And he said, anybody interested in the oboe? And I raised my hand and I have not regretted that one day of my life. I love playing the oval, so. That's fantastic. So, Kristen, why, why do so many people start with the flute or want to play the flute and wind up playing something else? For me, it was instant. Um, I had gone over to a relative's house, and actually their daughter came out and brought her flute and demonstrated it for me and played it for me, and I was just instantly in love. And it's just so beautiful. I don't, I don't know. I think... They just love it. <laughs> That's great. Uh, now, I'm curious because you um, are always breathing into your instruments. Do you ever get tired uh, during a, a, a concert or during a piece while you're playing your, your instruments? Um, and may, maybe we could, we could start with Christina. No, I wouldn't say I get tired necessarily from the breathing, but the muscles used in order to make the sounds that we're all making that can get exhausting. Mm -hmm. and, and, and any of uh, the others of you in, uh, uh, in terms of, of fatigue, is it difficult to uh, uh, keep playing uh, for as long as some of the pieces that we, that we perform are? Yeah, I mean, I would say I definitely get, um, I get pretty tired, but like Christina said, um, 
it's not just uh, the breathing, but it's it's everything that goes into it. And so for me, I can I feel a lot of fatigue in my face because um, when you go to play the clarinet, you've got to contort your face a specific way to get a specific sound. And so the muscles involved with that can get pretty tired um, if uh, you know if you go beyond your comfort zone of of what um, feels comfortable. That's great. And, and what about um, maybe favorite pieces of music that were written for your instrument? Can you tell us about, about that, Kristen? Maybe it was something that you particularly like to play that uh, really shows off the flute. There's a number of them. Um, the one excerpt that I was just starting to play a little bit before was Afternoon of a Fawn by Debbie and I just love it because it's so pastoral and the colors that you can get and the freedom that you have with playing the music and the solo itself is just wonderful. Um, Daphnis and Chloe by Ravel is another one. Mendelssohn, Brahms, the list goes on and on. In, in, indeed. And uh, Suzanne, do you, do you have a favorite piece that uh, you think that really shows off your instrument and, and that you especially like to play? Well, I do really enjoy playing the piece that I played for you earlier also. That was a piece by Rimsky korsakov called Scheherazade. And mm -hmm. I think the reason that I really enjoy that is because it's all about telling a story. When you play something in music, you're trying to communicate through the notes and the, the loudnesses and articulations. Um, and you get to do that a lot in that kind of music. So, you know, as far as solo pieces go, I really enjoy most of oboe music, uh, but I particularly like my Scheherazade today. Fantastic. Well, we're so glad that you shared uh, it with us and we're so happy to have heard each of you describe how you started on your instruments, why you started to play your particular instrument and what you love about the repertoire written for it. Thank you so much for sharing your instruments and your time with us today. Well, welcome everyone. It's wonderful to see the members of the brass section, the Racine Symphony Orchestra. It's um, uh, good to see you in your own spaces. And we look forward to hearing a little bit about your instrument and a little bit about uh, why you decided to play your particular instrument uh, this evening. So um, uh, maybe uh, for each of you to give us an idea about uh, what, um, why, why the instrument that you play? Maybe int introduce it uh, for us. Let's start with the uh, with the top of the uh, uh, br brass section, uh, the the trumpet. Uh, Pat, can you tell us a little bit about your experience and and why the trumpet? When I was nine years old, in my school music program, I was going to play the saxophone. That's what I had made up my mind to do but I had really crooked teeth and my music teacher said, that wouldn't be a good idea. You should play the trumpet. And so I ended up playing the trumpet in a class of 14 students. And by the end of the year, there were five of us remaining. That's, that, that, that's terrific. And, and um, can you tell us, uh, um, perhaps uh, the, our French hornist, uh, what, what precipitated your uh, going to the French horn? Was that your first choice? It was not my first choice, Pasquale. Um, back at Goodland School when I was there in fifth grade, to make the choice of what instrument you wanted, they started out alphabetically. And even though my last name starts with H, the trumpets and trombones were gone. And, <laughs> and I was not the biggest kid in class. So the biggest kid in class gets the, the tuba. So the music teacher looked at me and says, you're good for the French horn. So <laughs> that's what it was. Now, I, I, I do have to uh, 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 jump to David and ask if you were the biggest kid in the class. And in fact, that stereotype type held true for you. Uh, was that the reason why you chose the tuba? It wasn't the uh, fact I was actually one of the, uh, the uh, medium kids in the class at the time. Uh, the, long, the larger kids had longer arms, so they were shifted over to trombone. Um, 
I actually started on, and I kind of have, I joke, I have T-Rex arms. So I, I play, um, played the baritone, which is like the trombone. It has some valves like a trumpet. And then um, I played that for a year, but I did, I wasn't really satisfied. I wanted to play something much lower and they said, well, try this thing. So they had, they had me try and out the tuba and I liked it and I kept on playing it. That's that that that's great. And your experience on the trombone, uh, did you was it always the trombone? Oh, no, no. I, I bounced around a little bit. Uh, it was actually the flute first in the fifth grade. And a teacher sat me down for a whole hour to try to get a sound on the head joint, which I really wasn't successful in doing. Uh, but I told all my friends and I noticed the boys just kind of whispering. And, you know, I finally asked, you know, well, what, what's all of this about? And they said, well, in certain words, they basically told me that it was a girl's instrument. I quickly <laughs> ran up and told my teacher, I do not want to play it. I do not want to play it. So at that time, I was going into the sixth grade and I knew in my mind I wanted to play trumpet. Mm -hmm. So when I got to the band program, I told the band director I want to play trumpet. And he basically said, well, there are no more trumpets. Why don't you play this horn? Mm -hmm. And I looked, he held up a trombone. He showed me the trombone. And I said, I don't want to play that. <laughs> 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 I said, it's ugly, you know? And, um, and oh my God, I just <clears throat> fell in love with this instrument. I just love it so much. So um, what, what, uh, what about the trombone uh, was almost uh, your that you first gravitated to the, the first time that you heard it played maybe by your teacher or by a professional that said, wow, that's a lot better than, than uh, a, 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 the other instruments I could have chosen. I'm so glad that I've stuck with the trombone. I think it was my ability to be able to communicate myself through the instrument. Um, and it took it took many years. Uh, I, I mean, at, at that time, I was literally practicing five to seven hours a day. Mm -hmm. So I was really, really into it, but I wasn't making a lot of progress. Um, and it wasn't really till. Um, but it was it was like an outlet for me, you know. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 you know, as a teacher, as we know, a lot of times students uh, when they're not really, you know, progressing quickly in an instrument, they'll they want to do something else. But for me, it was just something about the instrument where it just held me for a, a, a long time. And then finally, when I got to the, my high school years, I was exposed to students at much higher levels than in middle school. And mm -hmm. I was just the kind of student that knew I was gonna dedicate myself and, and become that. And then eventually I, I, I just rose up and, and became you know a star in the program. And then it was just, you know, downhill from there. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Well, we won't call it downhill. Uh, now, Pat, uh, uh, tell me, because the the uh, instrument that you play uh, comes in in different sizes. Uh, I, I noticed that the members of the of the trumpet section uh, sometimes carry more than one trumpet at a time. Can you explain why that is? Yes, we do have more than one trumpet and the reason is um, it's, it's like a painter that has a palette and there are different colors for different moods and different situations. And so if I'm playing jazz, I might have what's called a B flat trumpet. If I'm playing symphonic music, I have what I'm holding in my hand, which is called a C trumpet. But there's even a shorter trumpet uh, called a piccolo trumpet. And mm. part of my story is that when I was in high school, I had a homeroom teacher that used to play records, old time records. And one time he played this recording of a piece by a composer by the name of Bach, the Christmas Oratorio. And I was just electrified. And I remember going up to him and saying, what is this music? And that was the moment for me that just changed my life. Um, and I've, I've never forgotten his grace in, in sharing that with people in the homeroom that really weren't very interested, but it was so important to me. 
Yes. Um, and, and, and for the first one, for Kurt, uh, could you tell us um, maybe um, someone or an experience that inspired you on, on your instrument, the, the French horn? Well, just to follow up what Pat just said, though, is that where she carries different trumpets, the French horn that I've got is actually two horns built into one, where I've got an F horn on the top side and I have a B flat horn on the bottom. So the F horn is kind of the mid range horn and then the, the B flat plays the high notes and the low notes best and you put it together, you can, you can do the whole, the whole symphonic arrangement just with one horn then. But uh, when it came to uh, inspiring, uh, actually, it was going to the fifth grade concert because I went to the fifth grade concert in 1971, I believe, and, and sat up on the top there at Park High School looking down at the symphony play. And I think I was playing with the symphony in 1975. So that's fantastic. I, uh, I, I, I wasn't going to hold you to those years, but it has been a long time tradition, obviously, of the Racine Symphony, which we're very proud of, giving uh, these, these concerts for the, uh, the fifth graders and now uh, fourth graders and, and have geared it to different uh, levels of school because of the importance of introducing these instruments uh, early. Um, David, when did you start uh, uh, playing an instrument, and then specifically, when did you start the tuba? I first started playing instruments uh, in my elementary school classes, music classes. Uh, we all played various things, maracas, um, chimes, zithers, auto harps. And it kind of got me into knowing, wow, there's different pitches. It makes different uh, types of range of sounds, and it makes different qualities of sounds. And it kind of sounded good. And then... Um, they had us uh, listening to brass instruments, but our music teacher always played lots of music. Basically, whenever we'd be coming into class or going out of the uh, leaving after school and be playing top uh, recording artists at the time. And back then it was it was LPs uh, records. Um, and hearing the Chicago Symphony Brass, hearing um, uh, there's a great album of Gabrielli music, which is three orchestral sections from the Philadelphia Orchestra, the Cleveland Orchestra, and the Chicago Symphony. And when I heard that, and I heard the type of quality of sound that a brass section could make, I was hooked from then on. But then I had a band director play the Stan Kenton uh, West Side Story. And I was mm. like, first of all, what is this musical? And then it's like, wow, that is some intense brass playing. And it's like, I knew brass was my instrument so I started on the instrument they started me on, on baritone. And then the next year I tried the tuba and actually had a band director who was, um, had a uh, colleague who was in the Orlando Philharmonic named Claude Kashnick. And Claude is a kind of a noted teacher. He actually gave me my first tuba lesson on tuba. Uh, hmm. And he actually also taught, as of note, the guy named Mike Roylance, who happens to be the tubist in the uh, Boston Symphony. So mm. uh, he uh, he has a great sound. He's from Green Bay, and he had a, just a great said, you keep at that instrument. You've got a sound that you like, and you just keep it and develop it. And I was hooked from then on. That's great. So, so we've been talking a lot about your instruments, but I, I, I'd like to take an opportunity to hear how they sound now. So um, maybe we could start from, from lowest to highest. David, we, we, we just left off talking to you. Let's, let's hear you play a little bit of the tuba. Okay. I'm going to play a little bit, but I'm going to show you how we make that sound. Uh, we buzz our lips. <laughs> And actually, the air goes through the lips and creates a vibration, sort of like air going past your wind, uh, your vocal cords to make a your sound in the voice. As the instruments get lower and higher, they have different rings sound. So like a smaller trumpet ring. Um, tr and then the big tuba ring, where you get more of the lip in the mouthpiece. <laughs> Doesn't sound like much, but when you put it on a mouthpiece, <laughs> starts to get a little better and then when you put all this plumbing on it so it just has that nice ring and resonance it goes all the different rounds ranges it can go medium it can go real high
that's the lowest fundamental sounds that gets on the horn. Got to got that is learning. that is great. I'm I'm, I'm wondering, Fred, would, could you do the same thing for us and uh, give us an idea of uh, also this uh, buzzing sound? Because I remember that the the, the brass. Uh, teacher, the band director in, at my school, when um, students were interested in starting lessons, that's the first thing they would have them do. They would have them buzz their lips and to see maybe that would determine what instrument they should play in the brass section. Um, can, can you give us a demonstration of that? Yes, uh, absolutely. And, and with my students, I do the same thing. And, you know, uh, we have, a, as we were sharing before you uh, joined us, uh, we have a young one in our house, two months old. Mm -hmm. And we, for our, our children, it just seems like you're made for to be a tuba player, a trombone player, if you're under three years old. Uh, because one thing children, <laughs> <laughs> my wife doesn't like to hear me say that, you know, I don't, <laughs> but yeah, but it's just natural for children. You know, it just seems like when we grow up and become adults, we forget how to do that. But children do it naturally and do it quite well. And so you just make that transfer to the mouthpiece. And then see if you can buzz high and low. OK, and one of the, the most famous things about the trombone is the slide sound. The gliss. And that's distinctly the trombone sound. Um, and so, uh, like the tuba, it can go uh, quite low. Okay. And then it could um, go high. If you can, uh, if, if you have a deeper voice and you can sing really high, that's pretty much the trombone range. Mm -hmm. Maybe a few notes higher than that, but that's pretty much the range. That's that's where my voice breaks too. Believe me, uh, that's uh, that's 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 great. And I, um, now for the uh, French horn, I'm interested in in uh, how it sounds when you buzz your lips on a French horn versus when you buzz your lips on a tuba or a trombone. Well, the French horn mouthpiece is considerably smaller than the tuba and the, the trombone. It's almost actually the same diameter as the trumpet, but it's got a little bit deeper bowl, a little bit different size outgoing. And, oh, there we go. They've got the two of them up there. But... The good. horn ends up having a pretty good range. It does indeed, even seemingly beyond what Zoom is able to amplify uh, at the lowest possible range. Uh, that is, that's, uh, that's, that's great. And, and moving to the trumpet. Now, we, we, we saw the difference between the mouthpiece of the trombone and, 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 um, uh, and French horn. Now, obviously, the, the trumpet mouthpiece, there it is. And, and how does the buzzing sound? differ. So if I put that buzz in my trumpet, what it does is go through all the tubing and the bell amplifies the sound and makes that characteristic trumpet or trombone or horn sound or tuba sound. One thing we didn't talk about was the trombone has that great slide, but the, the tuba and the horn and the trumpet have valves. Some of them are valves that go up and down. Some of them are called rotary valves that actually go in a circle. And I thought I would show you what a valve looks like. It's a little bit like cheese, Swiss cheese. Mm -hmm. it, it has holes in it. And when I press that valve down, what it does is line up with some of the tube, tubings 
on the trumpet, and that's how I get different pitches. Otherwise, the early kind of brass instruments were bugles. They were natural trumpets, and they didn't have valves, so you could only get a few notes. That was the limit of your notes, but by pressing the valves, which is as low as I can go. Right. That's, that, is, uh, that is great. So the valves really help us play a, a greater variety of music. Yes. That's wonderful. Well, thank you all for showing us your instruments, giving us an idea of what inspired you to play it, and uh, uh, just getting a chance to see up close and personal uh, these, these wonderful, uh, wonderful sounds. When we all play together, uh, the brass section really supplies that um, uh, heft of sound, that excitement uh, that comes in the, in the orchestra. Oftentimes it's associated with uh, uh, royal processions and, and this kind of uh, regal uh, circumstance is just uh, wonderful to hear. I know it was noted before about the Gabrielli uh, pieces for, for brass instruments and clearly this kind of music is one that uh, does inspire and uh, I'm so delighted tonight to have a chance to see each of your instruments individually. And I thank you so much for showing them to us. Thank you, Pasquale. Very good. Hey, everybody. My name's Toby Wilkinson. I'm the principal tippinist in the Racine Symphony Orchestra. And today we're going to show you some of the instruments of the percussion section. Uh, and we're going to start today with the timpani. To give you a little background about me, I, like you, have started music at an early age. I actually played trumpet when I first started in elementary school and then switched over to my main instrument being percussion and uh, have been doing that for 30 years now. I've been playing with the orchestra for almost two decades and the last 10 years have served as principal timpanist. So I'm excited to see you today and share with you some of the instruments of the percussion section. So we're going to start out with the timpani. And also, maybe you know this is a kettle drum, and uh, it's my personal favorite instrument. I love them all, of course, but uh, every percussionist has a home bass or a favorite instrument, and this is mine. So I'm just going to play a little bit for you today to show you some of the sounds of the instrument. This is a bass instrument, and so we read in bass clef. Oftentimes, the timpani part plays along with the tuba or the string basses or the low woodwinds. Um, and, or, the low, or the low brass, like trombone. But it's an exciting instrument, and um, I hope you enjoy some of the sounds. I want you to imagine that you're hearing the Olympic theme. Olympics are coming up this year, and this would be the timpani part from that most famous Olympic theme. So that was a little snippet of the sound of the timpani. And if you could imagine hearing the, the brass players and the trumpets playing the Olympic theme, that would be a really fun part to play along with those musicians as well. In the next segment, we're going to show you some of the other instruments of the percussion family. This instrument is a pitched instrument, meaning that we have to tune it and it has to have, play the right notes. And there are many other instruments in the percussion family that are tuned as well. In our next segment, we're going to show you some of those. Welcome back, everyone. As there are thousands of instruments in the percussion family, I thought I'd show you some of the other pitched instruments today. This marimba, uh, instrument you see here is called the marimba. It actually has its origins in Central America, very made famous very much so in Chiapas, Mexico, with the uh, marimba bands. And I thought I'd play you a little of the sound of this beautiful instrument, and I hope you enjoy. <laughs>
There are many instruments in the mallet percussion family of percussion section. Uh, this, like I said, this is the marimba, but we also have the glockenspiel. We have the vibraphone. We have the chimes. We, of course, have the marimba. And, of course, we have the xylophone. All of these instruments you'd probably see uh, in an orchestra concert uh, at, any, at any point. So these are part of the pitched percussion family. And next what we're going to do is we're going to show you some themes, uh, instruments from the non-pitched percussion family. Be right back. Welcome back. Uh, now we're gonna look at some of the instruments from the non-pitched uh, arena of the percussion section. And I thought we'd start out with probably the most common that you're gonna hear, and some of you will certainly play, is the snare drum. So I'm just gonna play a little bit of stuff here on the snare drum, try to give you some different dynamics, some rolls, and all the kind of things we have to do as snare drummers. That's our snare drum. Hope you enjoyed it. Next, we'll go to some of the other non-pitched percussion instruments. One you're gonna see certainly is the tambourine. It has a head on it much like the snare drum, but it's got these awesome jingles to make this sound. You can do lots of different things. Some thumb rolls. Regular taps, shake, has a lot of cool sounds. Another instrument you'll see very frequently is the triangle. And unbeknownst to a lot of people, there's actually a lot of technique involved in playing the triangle and to do it correctly. Here's a little sound uh, snippet of the triangle. And of course, we have a lot of other things in the percussion section. We have wood blocks. One cool thing, we have sandpaper blocks. And of course, at Christmas time or holiday time, you may have heard the sleigh bells in one of the tunes we like to play in the orchestra called Sleigh Ride. And we'll close out today for the non-pitched percussion uh, instruments. And we have the cymbals. A lot of you see them on drum sets, etc. These are the crash cymbals. They're a little noisy. But I want to play a little short example of something from a piece called Romeo and Juliet. If you know the story, the Capulets and the Montagues, they were feuding families. And in this section of the piece, the cymbals were supposed to represent the sword fight and the clashing of the swords. All right, that is just a small sampling of the hundreds, if not thousands, of instruments available to the percussion section. I hope you enjoyed it and hope to see many of you as future percussionists and musicians. Thanks, guys. Well, I hope you enjoyed that introduction to the instruments of the orchestra. We certainly enjoyed playing and explaining our instruments to you. And if you decide to play any of these instruments, we hope to see you someday in the Racine Symphony. Thank you very much. <laughs>